I'm, I'm so pleased to be here tonight to be honoring uh, Senator Mitchell. Uh, every Irishman in the country, in the world, can be thankful that we had George Mitchell for the great uh, uh, job he did over in Northern Ireland in, in settling the problems that they have, they've had. I've known the Senator for pretty near 40, 50 years, I didn't dare to say. And you can't find a nicer man, a more person, more well deserving than Senator Mitchell to receive this award in the cloud. Thank you. Well, I first met George Mitchell many, many years ago. Uh, before he had any public office, he was just a great asset to the Democratic Party. And I went years and years ago, went door to door, registered voters with him on Lower Congress Street, trying to get voters to uh, to register as Democrats, and uh, he was just at that time he was an assistant to Edwin Muskie and uh, did a marvelous job. But his his whole life after that, and I'm so proud of the fact of being Irish, of his efforts in in Ireland to create peace and harmony in the Irish government, which is very difficult to do. Good evening, all. What a wonderful evening. And we're just beginning. Welcome and thank you. The gathering of the clans. We have the Lewiston crew here. We have a contingency from Lewiston. We have the Cliffords. We have the Delahanties. We have the Minkowskis. We have a large contingency from Bangor here. We have the Murrays, and we have the Walshes, and the Kellehers. And then, of course, there's those people from Portland. <laughs> and there's the Carries and the Hobbins from Saco, and the McCarthys from Rumford. <laughs> and then there are our friends the French and the Italians and the Polish people and the Jewish people who come here because they know that they have a good time with all of us. Thank you all. <laughs> Welcome to the fifth annual Plata Award Celebration. Governor Brennan, welcome. Governor Brennan was our first Our first award recipient, a leader, a visionary, one who taught us that the best social service program is a job, and the best social service agency is the family. And there's no bigger family than the Irish. <laughs> Gerard P. Conley, Sr., who served his state and his city. You have the Conleys, the long and the short. There probably aren't any bigger clan than that. And Cynthia Murray Bellavo from Bangor and Hollowell. A leader, a spokeswoman, and she's still out there fighting the good fight, Cynthia. Thank you, Cynthia. And William J. Ryan, an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur who built a business. Um, and Mr. Ryan is not able to be here tonight. He and Peg are at another fundraiser for another, uh, another event. Past recipients. <laughs> Sorry, I stumbled. Didn't write it down. Past recipients, thank you for all of you. Thank you for your continued support of the work of the Maine Irish Heritage Center and all things Irish in Maine. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention Governor John O. Baldacci. <laughs> Governor Baldacci has been to every one of these. Thank you, Governor. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you all who give of your time, your talent, and your treasure to create and sustain our mission. The Irish Heritage Center is more than this beautiful building, and I hope that many of you had a chance to go upstairs and see it. And those of you who have been here in past years know that 
we've gotten a lot done in the last year or so. But it embodies the hopes and dreams of our ancestors and ourselves. Those from Ireland, and there are many here in this room, or of Irish heritage who came to America in search of freedom and the chance to make a better life for themselves and their families. As the title of St. Joseph College Professor Michael Connolly's book on the Irish in Maine suggests, they changed their sky. And changed their sky they did. The Irish were the first group known as immigrants, not settlers or pioneers. They are people who saw and still see America as a place where everyone has a chance. They came and they still come to this country in search of freedom and opportunity. That's why we gather this evening to celebrate our heritage, to honor one of our own who continues to serve his state, his nation, and the world with distinction. Senator Mitchell, welcome and thank you. I would now like to recognize our sponsors who have been so incredibly generous tonight with us. Andrew Gurley, many of you know Andy Gurley, he keeps complaining to me that I shouldn't be recognizing people from Maine that he knows, I tell him he just should move to Maine. <laughs> that wonderful law firm, Cloutier, Conley, and Duffett, who take care of all of us. Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, thank you Eddie Kane. Memek, the founder of Memek, Maine, Maine Employers Mutual Insurance Company. John Leonard could not be with us tonight. There are some folks here from Memek. John's speaking in Dublin. <laughs> he wished he was here. Nancy McCalman Brenneman and David Brenneman. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy and David. Phil Hoey Sr., whose son is here. Thank you, Phil. Ellen D. Murphy, Ellen who was smart enough to get here from New York City as quick as she could. Thank you, Ellen. <laughs> and the Irish American Club of Maine, without whom we would not be here. The Irish American Club of Maine, where are all of you? You're here somewhere. There. <laughs> These were the folks that put up the seed money and the energy to get this organization started. Thank you. Our silver sponsors, Congresswoman Shelley Pingree and Donald Sussman. Where are you, Congresswoman? <laughs> Cashman Management. Where are you guys? And St. Joseph's College, home of Professor Michael Connolly. Union Mutual Insurance Company, and Walter Barstaff. Our gold sponsors, Logan for Painting, and Robert Norris, and our founding mother, Maureen Coyne Norris. Thank you. Tonight we have two Emerald sponsors, Maura Hastings Fuller and Robert G. Fuller and Tom and Linda Walsh. I'd appreciate it if you both, all three of you come to the stage. All right. <laughs> Is it okay? <laughs> Bob and Maura, we thank you for your continued support of the Maine Irish Heritage Center. Your gift earlier this year seeded our rainy day fund, and believe me, we've had plenty of those. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Tom, we thank you and Linda for your generous donation to the Heating Fund to the Upper Level Sanctuary.
The gift from you and Linda brings us one third of the way to funding an energy efficient system which will allow us to use the entire building year round. Thank you. Okay. The bowls were a gift of Colleen Bolin, who is an, an Irish import business. They're absolutely gorgeous bowls made in Ireland. Thank you, everybody. It's now my honor to introduce Senator Margaret Craven, a native of Ireland who represents the city of Lewiston, another main city with a long Irish heritage. Senator Craven will bring greetings from the main legislature. Thank you and good evening. And I am so com um, amazingly uh, honored to be able to get up here and um, present this sentiment uh, to Senator George Mitchell. But I really have the distinction of having spent my first 17 years in Ireland and the rest of my uh, life in Maine. And no matter whether I'm in Maine or in Ireland and George Mitchell's name comes up, he is profoundly loved and appreciated. And, it, and I will speak about Ireland for now because he brought the gift of peace uh, to Ireland with his patience and his skill and his, uh, his taking the time to learn every nuance and every, every thing that he needed to know to bring people together for them to come together by themselves. So thank you, Senator Mitchell, for saving lives and for saving economies. <coughs> State of Maine. <clears throat> Be it known to all that we, the members of the Senate and House of Representatives, join in recognizing the Honorable George Mitchell, who is the recipient of the CAD Award from the Maine Irish Heritage Center for his efforts to build peace in Northern Ireland. We extend our appreciation to Mr. Mitchell and congratulate him on his receiving this distinguished award, and it be it ordered that this official expression of sentiment be sent forthwith on behalf of the 125th legislature and the people of the state of Maine. Thank you, Senator. Please now welcome a great friend of the Maine Irish Heritage Center, a friend who marched with us one very, very rainy St. Patrick's Day all the way down Commercial Street, an advocate and a leader for all of Maine, Congresswoman Shelley Pingree. Well, thank you very much. I, uh, I'm possibly the person who is standing between all of you in dinner, so uh, I won't speak too long. But thank you very much, Mary, for allowing me to be a part of this. Uh, thank you to uh, both governors in the room, Brennan and Baldacci, for your wonderful service to our state, to the entire Conley clan, who also ruled our state for wonderfully for a long time, and I was lucky enough to serve with one of them. And uh, thank you for gathering here to uh, recognize Senator Mitchell. What a wonderful evening and what a wonderful spot to everybody who's worked to preserve this location and support the Irish heritage that's so important to Maine and to Portland uh, and created this wonderful space where I've already attended. You know, so many great gatherings already have happened here. It's warm, it's welcoming, it feels like Portland. This is just a great thing that uh, you all have been working hard to do and everyone in this room is supporting. So thank you, thank you for creating that. Uh, it's great to be here tonight, to be part of honoring our, uh, our favorite senator from Maine, Senator Mitchell. And uh, I think all of us who have spent any time in politics consider him uh, our mentor, our friend, our incredible supporter. Uh, each one of us who's ever had the opportunity to serve in the state of Maine after, uh, after Senator Mitchell stepped into office uh, treats him as our, uh, our best person to go to for advice, the man who uh, knows more about almost any topic you could encounter as an elected official than anyone else I know, and someone who's always got a great ear and is willing to be there with advice, 
uh, political advice, uh, where better to get it than from someone who came from behind with 36 points behind to win his first office. By the way, do not mention that to my opponent. Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, who knows so much about Northern Ireland, the Middle East, serving in Congress in a time when it actually functioned and people worked across both sides of the aisle. Senator Mitchell shows up uh, for Democratic events, little and large. Uh, he's there when you need him, when you're in a tough election. He's there to endorse you, to advise you. Um, it's, it's just truly great that we have such an incredible mentor who's recognized both here in the state of Maine and around the country. I have a couple of personal stories, and I, I won't take forever, but Senator Mitchell and I, when we're at events together, we occasionally trade off who gets to tell this story, and because I'm going first, <laughs> um, it's mine tonight. Uh, back in the 80s, when Senator Mitchell uh, had vowed to visit every high school in the state of Maine, I had a wonderful experience uh, when I first got a chance to meet Senator Mitchell. He'd been, I think, to every high school in the state of Maine, and as you know, I live on the island of North Haven. It's been my home for 40 years, and North Haven and Vinyl Haven were gonna be his last visits. So he came out to the island, I think he went to Vinyl Haven first, but he ended up uh, coming to North Haven in a, in a very small plane, landing on our little grass airstrip. Now, I was in the toughest political uh, role of my entire lifetime. I was, at that point, on the local school board. Um, as all of you know, it's, it's a tough job, and I, I, I'm lucky I survived it, and it was a good training ground. But we heard that Senator Mitchell was going to come to visit our school, the smallest high school in the state of Maine, less than 100 students, K through 12. And I was designated as the person who got to pick him up from the airport. It's about the mid-80s. Um, I pack my daughter, Hannah, uh, and we're all ready to go uh, for this event. I drove, as you, uh, these are embarrassing stories, I drove a Volkswagen bus. Um, and somebody on the school board very politely suggested perhaps I should borrow someone else's car to pick up the senator when he came. So I had a wonderful station wagon that belonged to somebody else in town. I got up to the airport. I picked up Senator Mitchell, introduced him to my daughter, took him around to the school. He visited the school. And somehow on the way back to the airport, um, I had the courage to say to him, you know, I think I might be involved in, I might be interested in getting involved in politics sometime. And to his great credit, he did not make fun of me. He didn't laugh. <laughs> I think he looked in the back seat and saw Hannah and said, you know, she looks like she's going somewhere, <laughs> uh, which she has and she will. But uh, he was, it was wonderful that day. And when I finally ran in 1992, Senator Mitchell was there at one of my first events running for the state Senate when I was a long shot candidate myself, uh, hoping for an opportunity to, to win. And he has been there for me and for so many others in politics everywhere along the way. Wherever you go, if you're from the state of Maine, the ability to say, I come from the same state as Senator Mitchell and frankly, so many other great politicians who have served in our state, but to be able to say that. And I did uh, have the opportunity to visit Ireland once. Uh, I was working on uh, some, uh, uh, political work over there, helping some of the women who had been in the newly elected parliament, um, just talking about being in politics. I was a state legislator at the time. And I will admit, frequently, I would get into a cab or stop into a pub and say, you know, I know Senator Mitchell. And, uh, you know, there was always an extra drink, an extra Guinness, an extra anything. And uh, it was a wonderful, warm, welcoming place because people were so pleased that he brought the peace. So we're very lucky to be honoring him tonight. I'm thrilled to be in a room full of Irish people, even if I'm half Norwegian and half Swedish. Uh, no one throws a better party than the Irish people of Maine. So thank you very much for having me here. Okay, it's almost time for dinner. Right, Mr. Ambassador? Yes. We're very honored tonight to have with us the Ambassador from the European Union. Jose, I'm going to murder your name, sir. I apologize. <laughs> but he's from Portugal, and he's been to Lisbon today. <laughs> and we also know. And yes, he did drink Moxie. Mr. Ambassador. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much for the invitation. Like the Congresswoman, I'm standing between you and dinner, <laughs> and I'm not Irish either, so <laughs> it's a terribly handicap. But uh, anyway, I just wanted to say a few words to tell you that uh, Senator Mitchell's reputation goes well beyond Ireland into continental Europe. 
is enormously respected throughout Europe, throughout the European Union, as someone who's capable of dealing with the most difficult issues. Northern Ireland, Middle East, steroids and baseball. <laughs> so I'm sure there are a few people in Europe tempted to ask Senator Mitchell to help us with the euro area crisis. Uh, but I cannot be quoted on the last remark. <laughs> Senator, it's uh, an enormous honor and uh, I'm very happy for this coincidence of I'm traveling through Maine and I was, uh, you know, you were kindly inviting me for this uh, event. I'm so honored and privileged to be here with, with you to, tonight and all of you Irish friends and American friends and Irish descendants. I brought my main advisor who is Irish from Sligo, so uh, I, hope, uh, I hope you can accept me be, uh, among you. Uh, over, uh, during the afternoon I was texting uh, with one of my bosses, if not my most direct boss, uh, she is the high representative of the European Union for foreign policy and security. She's called Catherine Ashton. And uh, I was telling her that I was coming down to Maine and I was happy to be in an event with Senator Mitchell. And she texted me back saying, please tell George that I miss him. Please tell George that I want his expertise back on the Middle East uh, peace process and tell him that I want to catch up with him very soon. So, Senator, directly from Cathy Ashton and expressing all the uh, sincere uh, wishes of uh, all Europeans uh, with all respect and consideration for the great job you've done so far. Thank you very much. Father Phil Tracy. Where's Father Phil? Oh, there he is. I asked Father Phil Tracy, who's a longtime member of the Irish American Club, they're celebrating their 40th year this year, if he would give us the prayer before we have our meal. And he said, yes, he would. I asked him uh, if he would speak in Irish, and he said, no, he'd rather speak in English, but he could speak in Portuguese, and he could also speak in Spanish, right? <laughs> yes. So, Father Tracy. Thank you, Father. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you for all your gifts, all the blessings you've given us in life. We thank you for the peace that has come to Ireland for the last 90 years, and especially in the last 15. We ask you to bless all the people of Ireland, and we who are assembled here, and, we, and the food that we are about to eat, and we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Many hands make light work, and this evening is no different. There's several people that we owe a thank you to. Blue Elephant Catering for the wonderful meal. Thank you. And for stepping in at the last minute when our dear friend and caterer, Jeff York, died in August. And a special welcome to Terry York and York Catering, who came tonight to help us with our bar. Thank you, Yorks. Dan Mahoney for the sound, Josh Swan for the video, Patsy Wiggins of Boss Media. Patsy, we wouldn't be able to do the clatter without you. Tom Ryan, the bagpiper, and Baldacci Communications. Still helping those Irish, thank you. And our friends at Dale Rand Printing. We're a group of all volunteers, but there's one among us, our board member, our friend, and the glue that holds us all together, Pat McBride. Today is Pat's birthday, so if everybody would just shout, Happy!
Happy birthday, Pat! We'll now begin our award ceremony. The evening will begin with a video prepared by Patsy Wiggins of Boss Media, followed by remarks by Governor Joseph E. Brennan, and then our guest of honor and award recipient, Senator George Mitchell. After Senator Mitchell's remarks, we will present him with the fifth annual CLADA Award. I spent five years in Northern Ireland. I chaired three separate sets of negotiations. It was very difficult. For most of the time, there was little progress. There continued to be a, an unfortunately high level of violence. There were a lot of assassinations, a lot of bombings, a lot of actual violence and even more threatened violence. And I wondered whether or not I was having any impact, whether anything was being accomplished uh, in uh, October of 1997. Uh, I just barely made it home for the birth of my first son, Andrew. And uh, that first day in the hospital after he was born, and I held him in my arms, uh, I thought about, I asked myself the question, where do my responsibilities lie? It was one thing to be gone a lot when the only other person involved was my wife, who is an adult and could fend for herself, but were my obligations now that I should stay home and leave Northern Ireland. I'd been asked hundreds of times by reporters in Northern Ireland when I was going to leave because I had failed, and I thought about it a lot. And then it suddenly dawned on me, I wonder how many children were born today in Northern Ireland. And I began to wonder who they were, who their parents were, and of course the thought occurred to me that their parents wanted the same things for their children that my wife and I wanted for Andrew. So I stepped out into the hall, used a payphone. That's back in the days when there were payphones. It's only 14 years ago, but it seems like a century ago. And I called my office in Northern Ireland. And I asked a member of my staff to find out. Well, they keep good records in Northern Ireland, so it was just a matter of hours before she called me back and said there were 61 children born. And so it grew in my mind uh, about 61 children. Who were they? What would happen to them? What were the aspirations of their parents? Later, uh, not quite a year later, when we finally got a peace agreement uh, and I was with the delegates to the negotiations with whom I'd spent several years, most of it without any progress, but now we had succeeded. Uh, I told them that the agreement was for me the realization of a dream that had sustained me through those very difficult years. And now I said I have a new dream. I said I want to come back to Northern Ireland someday with my young son, who had been born just a few months earlier, travel around, show him Northern Ireland, explain to him what it means to me, and then to go sit in the gallery at the Northern Ireland Assembly, their parliament, and watch the elected representatives of the people of Northern Ireland engaging in debate in the ordinary issues of life in a democratic society. Agriculture, fishing, economic growth, health care. There would be no talk of war because the war would have long been over. There would be no, no talk of peace because peace would be taken for granted. And I said that on that day, the day on which peace is taken for granted in Northern Ireland, I will be truly fulfilled. By a complete coincidence, uh, about six months ago, uh, a producer for a documentary television company in Northern Ireland called me and he reminded me uh, of that statement which I'd put into a book I'd written about Northern Ireland. And he said, uh, we'd like to do a documentary of you and your son coming back to Northern Ireland. Do you think the time is right? And I said, yes, I do think it is right. And so this past spring, 
I went to Northern Ireland with my family. We spent a day traveling all around, and the BBC found several of the children who had been born on the same day as my son. And we visited several of the families. We spent a couple of days with them. It was really wonderful. And by another complete coincidence, uh, the BBC documentary is going to be screened in Northern Ireland in the next few days. I think it's Northern Ireland and Ireland, and then later uh, in the rest of the United Kingdom. So it's all come full circle for me. And it was a really great experience to have my son, my daughter, my wife, and I spend that time traveling around Northern Ireland. And I'll add just one final humorous comment. It rains a lot in Northern Ireland. And so I kept telling my kids, bring your rain slickers, bring your rubbers, bring your uh, hats and bring your umbrellas. And we loaded up all this gear for this trip to Northern Ireland. We got there and it was in March and to everyone's complete amazement, it was bright and sunny in the 70s every day, not one drop of rain. I don't think it's possible to summarize any individual's life in a few sentences or lessons. I think that all of us learn as we grow Indeed, I don't think we ever stop learning. Among the things that I've learned uh, over the course of a long lifetime of work and mediation and negotiation uh, is patience. Uh, I used to have a temper at one time, but I learned to control it. Uh, took some time and some difficulty. Uh, but being patient with others, uh, I think, is of critical importance to success in most endeavors in life. Perseverance, you have to be able to stick with it, uh, even in the face of repeated failure and, or lack of success, however defined. I think it's important to have goals in life and a plan, but to be prepared for unanticipated opportunities and risks. Uh, every human life is a complex mixture of plan and accident uh, anticipation and events that you never dreamed would occur but are suddenly upon you. And I think there has to be a willingness to take risk, uh, to take a chance. If you believe in yourself, uh, you're more willing to do so. But I don't think uh, that the feeling that is so pervasive among most people, including myself, which is fear of failure, that drives so much of human activity, uh, ought to be the dominant factor in anyone's life or decision. Uh, it's healthy to fear failure, but not to the point where it paralyzes you and limits you in risk taking. Uh, try, fail, try again, fail again, try again. I think that's the nature of human life and success. Well, I think it's necessary to have a good sense of humor in any aspect of life. Otherwise, you go crazy from all the frustration. Uh, you have to be able to laugh at things that might otherwise make you cry. Uh, I think that's especially true in my case when uh, I was blessed to have uh, two young children late in life. And uh, sometimes they try my patience, uh, but actually they teach me to have a good sense of humor, to be able to laugh things off, not take myself too seriously, especially myself, but not take them too seriously either. I think humor is very important in life, uh, otherwise uh, it would be a very dark and frustrating and sometimes lonely life without it. It's most obvious, of course, uh, in the case of Northern Ireland, where there is peace now, where once there was war, and yes, many people's lives have been saved as a consequence, and that really does mean a lot to me. Uh, it's also evident uh, in my work in the Senate, where I uh, tried very hard to enact legislation that would have a meaningful and positive impact, not just on the people of Maine, but all Americans. Uh, environmental protection legislation, uh, legislation to enable more youngsters to go on to college, eligible for assistance, legislation to uh, permit the construction of housing for low-income people. In fact, uh, to this day, the most successful such program that we've ever had, responsible for the building of two million 
housing units for low-income people all around the country. People who might otherwise be homeless or living in shelters have some place to live. So yes, that does mean a lot to me. But probably what means the most after my family is my scholarship program. Uh, when I was in the Senate, uh, I went to every high school in Maine. I think I still am the only elected official who's ever done that, and I actually went twice to every high school, once to speak at a graduation, and once or more to speak to an assembly or a class or attend some event at the high school. And uh, as a consequence, I saw the wide disparities in opportunity in Maine. And I remembered my own situation. I was 16 years old when I graduated from high school, insecure, naive, uncertain about my future. My father had lost his job earlier that year. He was uneducated. He'd worked as a laborer. And he spent a truly miserable year, miserable for him and for the entire family, out of work, looking for work. And there wasn't much prospect of my going on to college, as my brothers had on athletic scholarships. And then a few people helped me. A few people around Waterville, who, a couple of men I'd never met, uh, helped me to get into Bowdoin College, where I never dreamed uh, I would be able to go. And it always stuck with me that these men had no interest other than doing something good for me. And I didn't even know them. And so I hit upon the idea of a scholarship fund so that I could do for others what had been done for me. And as a consequence, uh, my scholarship program, which, as you know, now gives out a scholarship to a graduate from every one of Maine's 130 public high schools every year, has provided uh, nearly $9 million in direct assistance to more than 2,000 Maine youngsters who might not otherwise have been able to go on to get a college education. And they've done remarkably well. We have a very high rate of graduation, that is completion of uh, their college, which is better than most such programs in the country. And as I travel around the state, I run into these youngsters often, and it really does mean a lot to me. <laughs> That's a, that was on my desk. My daughter gave it to me, and uh, I thought about it a lot. As I said earlier, I had a little bit of a temper, really. Not, not a wild temper, but uh, I would get angry often, particularly when I first became Senate Majority Leader. When you're the Majority Leader of the United States Senate, there's a lot to get angry about. <laughs> it's a very tough job. Uh, but I realized that every time I got mad, I placed myself at a disadvantage. I lost control of myself and of the situation, and I didn't get the best result that I was capable of getting. So I gradually controlled myself and tried to observe that Irish maxim. I did have to say no to a lot of people often. There wasn't a day go by when I was Senator Bajarli when I didn't have to say no to someone about something. And that's hard to do. If you like people and you want to be liked, and that's the way most people are. We all want to be liked and we like people. And so I tried to improve my no saying, to be able to say no to people in a way that would reduce or minimize their anger and exasperation at having been denied, and maybe even on some occasion make it feel good about themselves uh, if I could do it. But it is a great Irish saying, and I, I commend it to everyone, particularly those in a position where you do have to say no to people. It really is tough, but after a while, not that you really get used to it, uh, but you can deal with it more effectively than without uh, that great Irish saying. Governor Joseph E. Brennan. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I'd like to give a shout out, shout out to my good friend, John Baldacci, the former governor. 
I've been a longtime admirer. He's got about the best record of any Democratic candidate in the history. He wins at the local level, at the legislative level, at the gubernatorial level. Republicans, they're so perfect. They don't lose. They just go right on. And I, I have to give a shout out to my good friend, Jerry Conley, who made my political career possible. When Although the hard work was done by his 12 children. <laughs> but but Jer I got elected to the state Senate. And Jerry just stepped aside, let me become the Senate leader, and gave me a platform to run for other offices and run and run and run. <laughs> but thank you, Jerry. Uh, that was a beautiful video, and very touching. And I never saw a judge show any temper whatsoever. <laughs> okay, yeah. Just imagine if he was 100% Irish. <laughs> you know, I'm going to talk about, uh, i got to put my glasses. Uh, George bringing peace to uh, Northern Ireland, you know, where the Catholics and Protestants were at each other's throats. It makes me think of that Irish story over in Ireland where two guys were in a fist fight on the street. Another guy walks by and he asks, is this a private fight or can anybody get in? <laughs> now, George got in. He didn't fight. He brought peace to Northern Ireland. We're so proud of him. <laughs> I don't think everybody knows his background in, in many respects, you know. Uh, George comes from the humblest of circumstances, but grew up in a great family. You know, uh, his mother, an immigrant from Lebanon, worked in a mill. And as he described his father, he sometimes wasn't working. Sometimes he worked as a janitor at Colby, worked as a laborer. He couldn't grow up in any more humble circumstances, but with a great family. He, as he mentioned, he graduated from Bowdoin and also graduated from law school. And he served in the United States Army. I'm a little jealous of this because he was the first lieutenant, which we had to salute. <laughs> I was an 18-year-old private. I'm still, not, I'm still not a big fan of that offices of men. <laughs> I once nearly got assaulted. I was at uh, uh, a place where generals, you know, get their practice as young colonels and majors and said, I was against this clear distinction of officers and men. They did not like it. They were all young majors. I, I just didn't like it. That's where I am. <laughs> but no, no, I mean, you, are you surprised? He was a, an intelligence officer. <laughs> I'm not surprised. It was because he had no temper. <laughs> and he worked as a trial attorney in the Justice Department. And he also worked as a very top advisor to uh, Senator Ed Muskie. He uh, was appointed as United States District Attorney by President Carter. In fact, we worked together then. I was somehow or other got to be Attorney General in this state. Later, George served as a federal judge. That's a big deal appointment. Uh, federal judges doesn't get any bigger in this state. But he wasn't satisfied there. He then went to the Senate for 14 years. But what's amazing about that, after serving just one full term, he was elected majority leader. And you can imagine that is a tough thing to negotiate with all those massive egos. You know, as they say, most of them not only think they should be majority leader, they think they ought to be president. And, and sadly, some of them become president at the times. So. <laughs> Don't misunderstand that. As President Pro Tem of the U.S. Senate, this is before I think he became Majority Leader, he was third in line for the uh, presidency after the Vice President and the Speaker of the House. And I think this is the closest, and Paul Mills is out there, he knows all about Maine history, that uh, any Maine person came to the presidency in over 100 years. This is, after he's down there just a few years, just an amazing story. Here's one that's interesting too. Year after year, 
I used to read it, you know, in the paper down there, the uh, Hill, the roll call. The Senate staff, these are the worker bees that do all the work, that have a chance to observe all the senators. Year after year, he was uh, voted the most effective of all 100 senators. That, that's quite an honor. He turned down an appointment to the United States Supreme Court from Bill Clinton. But I think he has nights that he kind of wishes he was on the U.S. Supreme Court. <laughs> After the Citizens United decision, which is destroying our political process. It, it's almost like seats in government now are up to the highest bidder. Who's got the most money? I just read recently in the Portland paper where almost $2 million is going to be kicked in in a Senate race in the state of Maine by three people who probably have never stepped into the state of Maine. It's nuts. George, you should have been on that court. <laughs> but George, back when he was in the Senate, I think led the fight for, against our involvement in the first Iraq war. Had he stayed in the Senate, I don't think we'd have these two dumb wars in Afghanistan and Iraq where thousands of great young Americans have been killed and maybe over 100,000 innocent Iraqis who did nothing to we Americans. As we've mentioned, he served as a special envoy to Northern Ireland under the uh, direction and appointment of Bill Clinton. He was so successful in helping to negotiate the deal that became known as the Good Friday Agreement. He was knighted by the Queen of England. Now, somebody who is Irish <laughs> and, 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 you know, uh, Irish and being knighted by the Queen of England, well, it, when I say that, everybody's entitled to one flaw in his life. <laughs> After 9-11, this is amazing, like there's only one guy in the country. He was the first choice, along with Henry Kissinger, to investigate the 9-11 terrorist attack that killed 3,000 or more Americans. George served as, this is interesting, as chairman of the board of one of America's most storied companies, the Disney Company, I don't know if they still do, which then owned ABC, ESPN, as well as the fabled amusement parks. And I think it's so fitting that George, uh, you know, would be the chairman of the board of Disney because uh, in many respects, he's led a storybook life. How do you come from that background and all the way up in water? I can understand at Portland, Monjoy Hill. <laughs> George won't like this next one. You know, he's, he's part owner of the Red Sox. And I say this, Brother Mitchell, you owe us an apology for your business season. And please explain how much you had to do or didn't have to do with bringing Bobby Valentine. And even worse, a few years ago, George led the investigation of the use of steroids in Major League Baseball. What I think is what the Red Sox lacked was some steroids. <laughs> this guy doesn't stop in sports or politics. Now the NCAA has appointed George as the monitor of the athletic integrity at Penn State following the Jerry Sandusky's sex abuse scandal that ultimately led to the dismissal of the iconic football coach, uh, Joe Paterno. George also created, as he mentioned in those beautiful remarks, and helped to fund the Mitchell Institute, which has made it possible over the years for hundreds of young Maine people to go to college. And that's a big deal. I want, don't, don't talk like Biden. It's just a big deal. I won't say what Brother Biden said. 
But I would give John some encouragement to do a certain thing when he speaks to that group again. And this is not a criticism of any of the candidates, but there was an article in the Portland paper yesterday. All five candidates for the U.S. Senate, two party candidates and three independents, all five, they didn't grow up in Maine. They weren't born here. They didn't go to high school here. You've got to speak to these kids to get involved so they can bring their experience of growing up in Waterville or Munjoy Hill or wherever it might be. It's not a criticism of people coming from other places. But, you know, I think we have some brains in this state, maybe a modicum of brains, and to, to get involved. And there's an excitement in public life, a lot of work, a lot of ups, and a lot of downs. These are just some of his many accomplishments, and I mean this, if you look his background up, he's got all kinds of them. I dare say that George Mitchell has had more accomplishments and more distinctions than all the candidates today that are seeking the presidency and the vice presidency in both parties. With all that he has done, he has made all of us in Maine extremely proud. And I, this is my view, I don't think there's any person from this state in our 192 year history that has done more or achieved more than George Mitchell. Someone recently said to me that Mitchell was one in a million. And my response was, try one in 300 million, the population of the United States. You know, I, on a personal note, uh, he's been very kind to me and my family. Our relationship was really formed when I was Cumberland County Attorney and George and I worked together as prosecutors. Actually, we tried one of the major cases together during that period. And after nearly a year, he left me. He left right after the case had been argued to the jury. And he was going on, I think, to run or be second or third in command of Ed Muskie's presidential campaign. But he was on the phone every 10 minutes. Did the jury come back? Did the jury come back? And it came back right from the perspective of a prosecutor, I meaning there were convictions. <laughs> and it, that's an amazing, because I came out of a criminal defense background where I, you know, my clients were never guilty. They were always upstanding, <laughs> good looking people of solid character. But what a job he did as a prosecutor, just excellent. And of course, he went on to a great experience over as the U.S. District Attorney and then as a federal judge. Um, everything he's done, he's done well, except that knighthood. I, I don't know about that. <laughs> but he didn't have to curtsy, I understand. <laughs> so uh, I don't want to be like in the Republican convention, those people that were nominating people went on longer than the other people. <laughs> So I am going to conclude my remarks by introducing a good friend of mine who I think has done us all proud, Senator George Mitchell. Thank you very much, uh, Joe, for that really generous introduction. The U.S. Constitution prohibits cruel and unusual punishment, <laughs> but it does not define the term. Surely, however, it includes anyone having to listen twice in one evening to an ex-politician. <laughs> so I'm going to scrap my two-hour speech, <laughs> having already given most of it through the video, and say just a few words uh, to express my gratitude to all of you, uh, and particularly uh, to Mary McElhaney 
and all of those affiliated with this award. I want to recognize and thank for coming uh, so many distinguished officials here. Congresswoman Pingree, thank you. <laughs> Governor Baldacci, thank you very much. <laughs> Tom Walsh, who's a sponsor of this event, and my foreign policy advisor. <laughs> and, of course, Joe Brennan. <laughs> Joe was extremely kind in his remarks and went into remarkable detail on almost everything I've done in my life. <laughs> but on one important aspect of it, he said nothing other than, speaking of me, after being a federal judge, he went to the Senate. Well, of course, as you all know, I was appointed to the Senate by Joe Brennan. There were many potential senators more qualified than I was. There were many others who could reasonably and rightly expect uh, to be looked on by Joe more favorably than me. Uh, but he made the decision to appoint me. And when I spoke to him about it, he said the following to me. He said, first, I just want to pass along to you a request from Senator Muskie that you consider keeping on as many of the members of his staff as you can. And I said I would do so. Then he said, I want to ask you for one thing. And I braced myself wondering what it is he would ask me for. And he looked me in the eye, he said, I ask only that every decision you make be based solely on what your judgment and your conscience tell you is best for the people of Maine and for this country. He went on to say, I will never ask you for anything more than that. And he never did. <laughs> Not once ever did he urge me how to vote tell me what to say, ask me to do anything, never. And I had, as Joe indicated in his introduction, known him and worked with him for many years. And in that process, he confirmed to me his total integrity and served as a role model and an example for me of what it means to be in public service for the right reasons. Joe Brennan served the people of this state and this country in a manner that was dignified, that was responsible, with great empathy for every single member of our society, and in a way that I think serves as a role model for more than just me, but for anyone who aspires to public service. So please join me in ex helping me express my personal gratitude to Joe, because the fact of the matter is, everything you saw and heard in that video 
would not have occurred but for the fact that Joe Brennan appointed me to the Senate. So thank you. Sir. It's a special honor to receive the Clyda Award because Clyda, the symbol of Clyda, stands for three important Irish virtues. Their love, friendship, and loyalty. And while, of course, they may be Irish values, they are not exclusively Irish values. Every human being everywhere needs love, needs friendship, and needs loyalty. Loyalty two ways. Not just to receive the benefits of loyalty, but even more so to give the benefits of loyalty. And so I thank all of those associated with this award for giving me the privilege of receiving it. I do want to say a humorous word about Joe's introduction. I, I give a lot of speeches, and I get a lot of introductions, and they're all very nice. They don't all me quite mean as much to me as hearing it from Joe because of our relationship, but still it's nice there is, there are two risks to this. One is a physical risk to health traveling around. Just yesterday noon I gave a speech in Palo Alto, California and I'll be giving them in other places, but the real risk is the mental risk. And that is gradually, insidiously, starting to believe the things you hear <laughs> in the introductions. <laughs> when I returned from my experience in Northern Ireland, where I spent five years, I wrote a book, and when it was published, I went on a book tour around the United States to promote sales. I received hundreds of invitations and I learned something then that I had not previously known and many of you may not be aware of and that is in the United States there are more Irish American organizations <laughs> than there are Irish Americans. <laughs> so, and almost all of them invite me to come, and as I travel around the country, they developed an informal competition <laughs> as to who could give the longest, the most exaggerated, the most fantastic introduction of me. And, and I succumbed to the temptation as I travel around the country, my head got bigger and bigger and bigger. And so I got to the last stop the Stamford, Connecticut Irish American Club, and I could just barely get my head in the door. <laughs> and when I did, the first person I met was an elderly woman who rushed up to me and said in a very excited way, I'm so thrilled to meet you, she said. I don't live anywhere near here. I drove three hours just to meet you and to shake your hand and to ask you to sign my poster. She said, I think you are really great. And I said, well, of course, I'd be happy to sign your poster. So she gave it to me with a pen. I looked at the poster, and I said, well, I'm happy to do this. I said, but before I sign it, I think there's something I should tell you. She said, what is it? I said, I'm not Henry Kissinger. <laughs> the poster was a big picture of Kissinger. She said, you're not? She said, well, who are you anyway? And when I told her, she expressed her dismay. She said, this is terrible. She said, I drove three hours to meet Henry Kissinger, and all I've got is you. I said, well, I'm very sorry. I wish there was something I could do to ease your pain. She thought for a moment. She said, well, there is. I said, what would you like? She leaned forward in a conspiratorial way. She said in a low voice, Nobody will ever know the difference. <laughs> he said, he said, 
you just go ahead and sign Henry Kissinger's name to my poster. And I did. And so somewhere in the far rural areas of eastern Connecticut, there's a poster of Henry Kissinger with my writing of his name on it. Now here's the best part. Just a few months ago, I appeared in New York on a joint program with Kissinger. We, we, we've known each other for years, and we've appeared together several times. And we spoke and answered questions, and I told this story at the beginning. And on the way out, he said to me, he said, yeah, I've got to tell you. He said, I've heard you speak so many times. I've been with you so many times. He said, I've never heard you give a better talk than you did tonight. <laughs> and I said, really? I said, what part of it did you think was the best? He said, well, I really kind of liked that story at the beginning. <laughs> and I think you should tell more of that all around America. So I can report to him that in Portland, Maine, they all know about the Kissinger story. Let me, uh, let me say just a few words uh, about my experience in Ireland. Uh, as Joe indicated, my father's parents were born in Ireland. Uh, they emigrated to this country and settled in Boston, where my father was born in 1900. Sadly, his mother died shortly thereafter. His father couldn't care for the children, and so my father never met or knew his parents. He and his siblings were raised in orphanages uh, operated by nuns in the Boston area. And he stayed there for several years. Back in those days, as I later learned, the nuns used to take the children, the orphans, on the weekends out in what they called the Saturday specials. And they would take them on Sundays to the churches, particularly in Maine, New Hampshire, and Western Massachusetts. And at the end of each mass, they would line the children up in front of the altar rail, and any parishioner Anybody in the church at that time who wanted to adopt a child could simply take a child by the hand and leave without any papers, without any background inquiry at all. Of course, the potential for abuse was enormous. There were tremendous abuses, particularly in the rural areas where many young boys were, in effect, made indentured servants, weren't allowed to go to school and worked on farms. So gradually the laws were changed to prevent that abuse, but my father was very lucky. He was adopted in Bangor by an elderly couple who were childless, who shortly after they adopted him, uh, moved to Waterville. And they ran a little store there and lived in an apartment in the back, back of the store in, 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 in an area that was essentially a slum. It's now been torn down uh, and uh, made into a park and a parking lot. My father had no education. He went to school, we think, for about three years. Uh, and then he left school to begin uh, a life of hard work and low wages. Uh, he met my mother, who immigrated to this country from Lebanon when she was 18, and who, by coincidence, moved in with her sister, who had preceded her in immigration, uh, and happened to live next door to my father's parents. And just as a footnote, although Governor Baldacci himself is an Irish, he has Irish roots by marriage because Governor Baldacci's grandmother was my mother's third sister, and she settled in Bangor. So I think he qualifies, really, <laughs> and a little bit. And his brother Bob, who's arguably an even greater politician than John, you notice has a brilliant green tie on here tonight. Uh, so uh, they met and fell in love, and I was the uh, fourth of five children. My father had uh, no education, and he had no sense of his Irish heritage. He had never known his parents. He had been raised in an orphanage, and he was raised in Waterloo by a family who was not Irish. And so when I, at the request of the president, went to Northern Ireland, while it was a very difficult task, and while it was for the most part discouraging 
it was also for me one of the great opportunities and benefits of my life because I discovered and felt the true meaning uh, of my father's heritage back in Ireland, a place to which he never went, and indeed I never heard him say the word because he had no sense of it. We of course knew about our Irish heritage because my father's older brother also was adopted from the orphanage by the Carroll family from Portland. They didn't change his name, and he grew up as Francis Kilroy. My father's original name at birth was Kilroy before he was adopted. And Francis married uh, a well-known Portland woman, Jane Callan, who then, as Joe and many of you will recall, served in the state legislature and in the state senate for many years. And my first contact with them and with Portland came when we used to come down in the summer and visit, the Kilroys then lived on Grant Street. First time I ever went to Deering Oaks was taken by the hand by my uncle Francis, taken down there. And so when I went to Northern Ireland and traveled throughout Ireland itself, uh, I felt a, an awakening of a heritage of which I really had not been aware. And it is a perfect illustration in life that when you do something for others, you are the beneficiary. It really is a, a, an important principle in the life of the people of Ireland, both those who are there and stayed there and those who traveled around the world. It is indeed a fundamental tenet of the Catholic Church, to which most Irish believe, that it is in the giving to others that we ourselves achieve full realization and true fulfillment. And I think that ought to be, for all of us, the lesson of our lives. I want to close with a personal story that makes this point. Joe mentioned that before entering the Senate, uh, I had the privilege of serving as a federal judge here in Portland and in Bangor. It was a great job. I really enjoyed it. Truly the only job I've ever had where I had real power. <laughs> Believe me, the Senate Majority Leader has no power <laughs> other than to ask senators to do things that they should do without being asked. <laughs> and when I chaired peace negotiations in Northern Ireland and went to the Middle East, I, I couldn't compel anybody to do anything. I could ask, and I often begged, but I never ordered. But when I was a federal judge, <laughs> I issued orders. <laughs> and I'm proud to tell you that without exception, every single order I issued was carried out to the letter. And I, re I really loved that part of the job. <laughs> but, what I most enjoyed was when I presided over naturalization ceremonies, their citizenship ceremonies. A group of people who'd come from every part of the world who gathered before me in a federal courthouse here in Portland or in Bangor. They'd gone through all of the procedures, done everything, and in the final act, I administered to them the oath of allegiance to the United States, and then by the power vested in me, under our Constitution and law, I made them Americans. It was always an extremely emotional ceremony for me because of my parents' histories. And after each ceremony, I invited the new Americans to meet with me one at a time, individuals or in family groups. And I talked with them and asked them where they were from, why they came, how they came. Their stories were all inspiring. Keep in mind that almost all of us here are Americans by an accident of birth. Every one of them and a few people here have come from other places, some at great risk and cost to themselves. And although their stories were as different as their countries of origin, there were some common themes and they were best summarized by a young Asian man who when I asked why he came replied in very slow and halting English. I came, he said,
because in America, everybody has a chance. Think about the fact that a young man who had been an American for 10 minutes and who could barely speak English was able to sum up the meaning of our country in a single sentence. America is freedom and opportunity. And they are inseparable. We will be free and we will be much better off so long as every member of our society has the opportunity to go as high and as far as talent, willingness to work, and willingness to risk will take them. That's the greatness of America, the first true meritocracy in all of human history, the first place in which everybody ought to have a chance. Now, we know that as great as our country is, it is imperfect. No human being is perfect and no human institution is perfect. So what I've just described represents an aspiration, not truly fulfilled for everyone, but enough to cause us to succeed, but with enough left to go to cause us to strive to improve. And our task as Americans is to see to it that every child, every child, wherever they are, whatever their background, has the same chance in life that Joe Brennan had, that I had, that John Baldacci had, that Shelley Pingree had, that every one of you here had. Some will rise, some will not, but no one should ever be denied the opportunity to go as high and as far as they can. And we will all benefit, not just the individuals. There is a profoundly mistaken attitude in much of this country today based on the mistaken belief that we only have so much pie. And if he gets a little bit of it, that means that you get a little bit less. People fear change, and they fear the future. Not just Americans, not just now. I'm going to read to you, recite to you, almost verbatim, a quotation. God is gone. Faith is gone. Men can no longer be trusted. Traditional values are in decline. Those words were written in the year 555 BC, more than 500 years before the birth of Christ, the Greek city-states were making a transition from dictatorship to democracy. And those who had power, such as the writer of those words, regarded democracy, that is, the right of self-governance of all people to be a disaster and a decline in traditional values. They were having a hard time and people were easy prey for demagogues. We're having a hard time in this country now. And so many people succumb to the temptation, the temptation to regard those unlike themselves as other, alien, not to be helped, the temptation to think that the pie is fixed and we can't help that boy because otherwise our girl will lose something. That's not what America is. That's not what made America great. We believe in a growing pie. We believe in a society where if this young boy or girl over here gets a good education and benefits, we all benefit. We believe that Everyone should have a chance to rise, and everyone should have a chance to succeed. And our task, we should so conduct ourselves to meet the task that 100 years from now, a young man gets sworn in as an American at the courthouse here in Portland and says he came here because in America, everybody had a chance. And that aspiration will be a reality, and we'll all be better off. 
Thanks to all of you for what you've done. Thanks very much for the Clyda Award. Mary, again, especially. Where's, where's Mary? We're over here. Mary, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mary was my chief of staff when I was in the Senate. So when I came in tonight, one guy I know come up and said, what are you doing here? Why are you doing this? I said, I'm doing this because Mary McElhaney told me to be here. <laughs> I said, I've been, I've been, for 20 years, I did what Mary McElhaney told me what to do. Look where I've gotten. Why should I change now? <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Senator. I could ask you all to take your seats again and we'll present Senator Mitchell with a Clatter Award. Except for those of you who are Irish born, I would like all of you to come up to the stage and help Mara Fuller present Senator Mitchell with the award. Now I know there's a lot of you in the audience, come on. There's some people from Belfast here. There's a lot of people from Galway. Come on, Hugh O'Shea, that's good. All right, where's Mr. McClay? Okay, come on, everybody. Come on, Ann. It's a great honor tonight to be here and to have all the people around and all our friends and to welcome George Mitchell, Senator George Mitchell. And I am very honored to be able to talk and say that he is the greatest man that I think Maine has ever produced. <laughs> Thank you, Mara. And uh, Mary McVeigh, this is a very special Waterford Crystal Bowl given to us by Father John Feeney from his collection. <laughs> And Father Feeney, if you would come down and close the evening with your wonderful Irish blessing. Yeah. Uh, well, I want to say one thing with all these Irish-born people up here. Uh, when I first went over there, uh, of course, it was widely publicized, and the story of my father was written up and on TV. And so I started to get a lot of calls from people who told me they could trace my father's history which we didn't know much about. And uh, it's sort of a kind of a minor industry in Ireland, uh, <laughs> finding the roots of Americans. <laughs> and uh, one guy came up to me and said, Senator, he said, if you pay me enough, I'll not only find your father's history, he said, I'll connect you to Brian Baru. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to all of you for being here. <laughs> May the road rise up to greet me too. May the wind be always at your back. May the rain fall soft upon your fields. The sun shine warm upon your face. And until we meet again, until we meet again, may God hold you, may God hold you in the palm of his hand.
Krishna.